good evening ladies and gentlemen uh, welcome you all to this webinar on ecc basic and beyond this is our ninth lecture today's topic is supraventricular tachycardia our today's speaker is our teacher our international advisor uh, dr rafiq ahmed sir and we have got two of our course directors with us professor m athar ali and professor abdul wahid choudhury and we have got our uh, number of teachers and colleagues respected persons in our panelist uh, including professor jaki sir professor mohsin hosen professor orun maske professor mg azam professor sajul banerjee sir and uh, many other teachers may i request professor m athar ali sir to say few words about today's topic hey. in brief act to act to bhul holo ashole ajke lecture kintu athar bhai debe Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, today our speaker is Professor M. Athar Ali Sir. Uh, we have got our international advisor, Dr. Rafiq Ahmed Sir, with us. Uh, may I request Professor Abdul Wahid Choudhury Sir to say a few words about today's topic? First, a brief comment, and then Professor M. Athar Ali will start his presentation. Uh, I think a lot of people are actually waiting for Athar Bhai's lecture. Uh, his lecture is always uh, very informative, very entertaining, very funny, very enjoyable, and always you can take something uh, to your home, new thing. Even us who claim to know a little bit, we also always come to know a little bit more from his lectures. And a simple ventricular tachycardia, uh, very favorite in the exam, and also very important in the daily practice. I think. Uh, without much ado, Professor Athar Ali can start uh, our today's lecture. Athar Ali, you, you are welcome. Thank you, sir. Uh, our today's speaker is Professor M. Athar Ali, sir. Uh, I think every one of you know him about him. He is our teacher. He is one of the pioneer in the electrophysiology of Bangladesh. And may I request Professor M. Athar Ali, sir, to start his lecture to deliver his lecture. Professor M. Athar Ali, sir, please. Thank you, Dr. Firoz, uh, for your uh, nice introduction, and Professor Abdul Wadud Choudhury. And I also thank you very much for your excellent introduction. And it is very much uh, not very easy to talk on ECG in front of the such distinguished faculties, particularly our teacher, Rupik sir, Shadul Vairaj sir, Abdul Al Jamil, and Professor Abdul Wadud Choudhury, and so many uh, Professor uh, Jaki Roshan also. And uh, our, as you know, the, there are three segments of our session. Just after what is uh, Dr. Firoz already told, that is not, uh, that is not, uh, that is not wrong actually. After my lecture, there will be the most interesting session that will be uh, done by the professor, uh, our Dr. Rubik Ahmed Rubik sir. Amitsar, so yes. uh, there will be a second section, section that is the most interesting session, that is the interactive ECG session. Just after my talk, my talk will be very short, particularly on the supraventricular tag area. So I want to share my screen. Can you see the screen? Uh, no, sir, not yet. Our screen and niche green J up air was so it at the click or let show up. Hello, Nietzsche parallel green up air was so it at the click on the shows button.
স্যার আপনি কি শেয়ার স্ক্রিনটা খুঁজে পেয়েছেন স্যার শেয়ার স্ক্রিন পেয়েছি কিন্তু আমার দাও আচ্ছা শেয়ার স্ক্রিনে প্রথমে ডাবল ক্লিক করেন স্যার দুইটা ক্লিক করেন আচ্ছা এখন তো স্লাইড দেখা যাচ্ছে না না এখন হচ্ছে আপনার আপনার স্ক্রিনটা আসবে না স্যার দেখা যাচ্ছে না এখন আসলে হ্যাঁ আপনার স্ক্রিনে যে ফাইলটা করতে যাচ্ছেন ওটাকে ডাবল ক্লিক করেন জাস্ট এ মিনিট হ্যাঁ আপু দেখো তো শেয়ার স্ক্রিনটা प्रथम प्रथम स्लैड ट দেখা যায় ফিরোজ জি স্যার দেখা যাচ্ছে স্যার শোনা যাচ্ছে দেখা যাচ্ছে সো সুপ্রাভেন্টিকুলার টাইকারিয়া ইজ এ গ্রুপ অফ অ্যারিথমিয়াস দি সাবস্ট্রেট অফ হুইচ ইজ আইদার ইন দা অ্যাট্রিয়াম অর ইন দা এভি নোড লাইক দিস আইদার ইন দা অ্যাট্রিয়াম অর এভি নোড হোয়ার দা সাবস্ট্রেট আর সিচুয়েটেড এন্ড অন দিস বেসিস দ্য সুপ্রাভেন্টিকুলার টাইকারিয়া ক্যান বি ক্লাসিফাইড ইনটু আইদার অ্যাট্রিয়াল টাইকারিয়া অর দা নোডাল টাইকারিয়া the atrial tachycardia has already discussed by our dr rupi khabe sir in the previous lecture i will concentrate just talk on the nodal tachycardia that is avnrt avrt and junctional tachycardia today's lecture particularly on this uh, and supraventricular tachycardia again can be subdivided into another group that is called the paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia is the special characteristics of the clinical characteristics of this groups of the tachycardia we start suddenly stop spontaneously and usually the mechanism is reentry so i will talk supraventricular tachycardia particularly paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia which includes avnrt avrt and junctional tachycardia as because the atrial tachycardia is already discussed by dr rupi khabet sir so this is the group of the supraventricular tachycardia and ecg is the main this is the main key for classifying these groups of the tachycardia first of all these groups of the tachycardia can be divided into narrow qrs tachycardia and the wide qrs tachycardia by the ecg and secondly the narrow qrs tachycardia can be again divided into irregular tachycardia and regular tachycardia and these are the examples of all the supraventricular tachycardia that is atrial fibrillation atrial flutter atrial tachycardia ev nodal reentry tachycardia and atrioventricular nodal tachycardia these are the examples of the narrow qrs regular and irregular supraventricular tachycardia and again the wide qrs tachycardia may be again classified into aberration or with the pre excitation so these are the groups of the supraventricular tachycardia and that can be classified on the basis of their ecg and although there are several numbers of the examples of the supraventricular tachycardia but we can summarize by ecg all the supraventricular tachycardia into four groups that is this is one of the ecg that is this is the regular narrow complex tachycardia this is one of the presentation of the supraventricular tachycardia that is regular narrow complex tachycardia this is another group that is the regular that is irregular narrow complex tachycardia this is also one of the examples of the presentation of the supraventricular tachycardia this is another group that is 
white QRS complex tag area, that is the regular, that is regular white complex tag area. And this is another group that is the irregular white complex tag area. So these are the four groups of ECG that represent actually the whole groups of the supraventricular tag area. So these are the four ECG. Actually, we, if you analyze this, if we can analyze these four ECG, we can, I think, diagnose most of the supraventricular tag area. So these are the four groups of the supraventricular tag area. Regular narrow complex, irregular narrow complex, regular white complex, and irregular white complex. And P, that is the P wave, as you know, that is the systemic approach for the analysis of the arrhythmias. And particularly in this case, particularly for the analysis of the supraventricular tag areas, this is the P wave that plays the key role for analyzing these groups of the supraventricular tag areas, P. And particularly the characters of the P, that is the morphology of the P wave, axis of the P wave, RPR and the RP relationship of the P wave and relation of the P wave, the QRS complex. These are the four important criteria of the P wave. So we have to find out to see the P waves in the supraventricular tag areas, whether it is seen or not seen. And then we have to analyze the morphology axis PR and RP and the relation of the QRS complex. So these are the key ways to diagnose the supraventricular tag areas. And not only the P, all these criteria, P rate has got also some important roles for classifying the supraventricular tag areas. As for example, sinus tag area, usually the rate is more than 100 beats per minute. And this is the So this is the sinus tag area. The rate is usually more than 100 bits per minute. This is the atrial tag area. The rate is usually 150 plus minus 50 bits per minute. This is the supraventricular tag area. The rate is usually 200 plus minus 50 bits per minute. And this is the atrial flutter. And this is the atrial fibrillation. So there is some unknown reason. There are some rate relationship of this types of the tag area with the so P rate. That is the rate of the atrial depolarization or the P rate, or we can see sometimes it is the flutter rate or the fibrillation rate. So it is the actual depolarization rate that helps to diagnose the supraventricular tag area. So rate has got also some important role. As for example, this is one of the examples of the narrow complex regular tag area. This is the narrow complex regular tag area. Here the heart rate is 150 beat per minute. You see the rate is in the rate is about that is p rate is about 300 here see this is the p this is the p at the rate is nearly 300 bits per minute there is the atrial depolarization rate of the p rate and also in this case also the p rate is nearly 300 so from the rate what we can suspect this can be a case of the atrial flutter as because you know the rate of the uh, atrial flutter is p rate is nearly about 300 bits per minute plus plus 50. so this is the by analyzing the p rate we can tell that this may be a case of the supraventricular, that is the atrial supraventricular tag area, particularly the atrial flutter. And if we further analyze this, then we can see there is the short tooth appearance of the, there is no clean cut P waves. This is the no isolectric line. So these are the suggestion of the atrial flutter. So this is the atrial flutter. This, this, is, this is the example of the atrial flutter. But sometimes the P waves are not similar. As for example, in this case, this is the P wave, this is the P wave. The P waves are very clean cut and something not un that is not usual like the atrial flutter. So big size the P waves. So but the rate is nearly 300. The rate is 300. That rate such as the atrial flutter and the P wave morphology is like this. And here you can see this is the positive P waves and here you can see the negative P waves. And the rate is fixed. That is atrial. That is the 150 rate. That is fixed 150. Rate. So that is atrial rate 300. Ventricular rate 150, that is 2 is to 1 conduction, no isolectric line, and, and the sawtooth of the flutter appearance all suggest this can be a case of the atrial flutter. So there is the P wave morphology, P wave rate has got some important role for classifying these groups of the narrow complex regular take at your what type of it is. I will not discuss it further at was it is shown by the uh, Dr. Ropi Kamesar in the previous lecture, but just as it has got some relation with the supraventricular tag area. So this is the example how we can classify, that is how we can analyze 
that is supraventricular tachycardia. So here the P is unusual is because this patient has got the structural heart disease. This is the case of the tetralogy of the flat. So this is the result. The P looks like this, but not in the previous ECG. So, but the location of the P has got tremendous role. This slide was shown by Dr. Ropi Kamesar in previous lecture. I will again show this as because this conception is very important for analyzing the supraventricular tachycardia as because the relation of the P with the QRS complex, the location of the P in the ECG is very much important. As for example, in the first row, there is no P wave, visible P wave. This is the QRS complex, the P is within the QRS complex. That is, this may be a case of the supraventricular tachycardia where we cannot see the P wave. And sometimes you can see the P wave just after the QRS. And but the P wave is just close to the QRS complex. The, uh, the interval from the R to P is less than 80 millisecond. That is uh, less than the two small squares. So this may be one of the location of the P wave. That is the RP relation. That is the interval may be less than 80 millisecond. And again, the P wave location may be further away from the previous QRS complex. That is the inverted P and the RP. That is the R and this is the P. This interval may be more than more more than 80 milliseconds. That is more than two small squares. So this and this is again another is a, another kind of the supraventricular tachycardia where the location of the P wave may be just before the next QRS complex, but the P is positive. So this this kind of the these are the long RP tachycardia. That is the R and this is the P and this is the P and this is the R. So RP is larger, longer than the PR. So this is the long RP tachycardia, but the P is positive here. And this is another group. This is the R and this is the P. That is RP, the long RP tachycardia, but P is inverted here. So these are by location. These are the groups of the tachycardia. So we have to see. We cannot see. We may not see that P wave. That is, there is no P wave. P wave just up the QRS complex. That is, RP is less than 80 milliseconds. P wave is further away from the previous QRS complex. That is, RP is more than 80 milliseconds. Or P wave may be situated just before the next QRS. That is, but the, it may be positive. So these are the groups of the uh, I mean, locations of the P waves that helps to diagnose the supraventricular tachycardia. So this is an important slide that was shown by Dr. Ropi Kamitsar in the previous lecture. And so by summary, what we can see, there may be no P wave. Examples of the AV, NRP or junctional tachycardia or maybe upright P wave just before the next QRS complex. This is the example. That can be a case of the sinus tachycardia or sinoatrial reentry tachycardia or atrial tachycardia sometimes. Or P wave may be retro P wave may be just after the QRS complex like this. This. When the RP, that is the RP uh, uh, interval is less than 80 milliseconds, it is avianity like this. It is the avianity most likely. Or when the RP interval is more than 80 milliseconds, it can be AVRT like this. Or sometimes it can be the junction tachycardia as well. And long RP tachycardia. These are the long RP tachycardia. That is one group. This is the uh, this is one, one group where the examples are like this. Or this is another group where the examples are like this. That is the atrial tachycardia or atypical avianity. So by location of the P wave in relation to the QRS complex has got tremendous role for classifying supraventricular regular tachycardia, what it can be. This is an example of the regular narrow complex tachycardia where heart rate is 150. It is regular. This is the location of the P wave. That is the P is positive and just before the QRS complex. So by definition, this is the long RP tachycardia. That is RP. That is the long RP tachycardia. And these are the differential diagnosis. That is the sinus tachycardia, atrial flutter, atrial tachycardia, AVRT or AVRT. All we can consider as the differential diagnosis in such type of the narrow complex regular tachycardia. But what is actually it is? As because it is the sinus tachycardia. As because the P wave is situated just before the QRS complex. And P wave is positive, and the PR interval is more than 120 millisecond. If it were less than 120 millisecond, we should consider other diagnosis. But as it is more than 120 millisecond, this is the classic example of the sinus tachycardia. So, sinus tachycardia is one of the, one of the example 
of the regular supraventricular tachycardia. This is one of the examples of the long RP tachycardia. And the main characteristics of the supraventricular tachycardia is the location of the P wave, that is, the P should be in front of the QRS complex. That P must be positive in at least lead two. And the PR relation is usually more than 120 milliseconds. So this is the sinus tachycardia. But these are the differential diagnosis. Academically, you can say these are the differential diagnosis, no problem. This is another example where this is the narrow complex regular tachycardia. This is the regular narrow complex tachycardia. And the other one is the irregular tachycardia. In case of the regular narrow complex tachycardia, the classic example is the paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, as you know. And this is another group of the tachycardia. There's irregular narrow complex tachycardia. So this is the way, simple way to classify the narrow complex tachycardia into two groups, that is the regular and the irregular. The examples of the irregular tachycardia are usually atrial fibrillation, atrial tachycardia, or the atrial flutter into variable block. So the narrow complex regular tachycardia, again, by this way, whether it is regular or not irregular, we can classify and and you can pinpoint the diagnosis, what the diagnosis, going toward the diagnosis, what it can be. That is the regular and the irregular. And this is the inside of the heart. This is the atrial area. This is the sinus node. This is the atrial ventricular node. This irregular tachycardias are usually originated from the atrium. And the regular paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardias are usually originated from the nodal area, that is the AV node. So this is the way that is the nodal tachycardias are usually regular and uh, whether their uh, p waves can be seen or not these are the regular tachycardias and atrial tachycardias in some ways whether it is atrial fibrillation or atrial tachycardia or atrial flutter with the variable block in some ways they show their irregularity so this is the way we can uh, also analyze the substrate of origin of these groups of the tachycardia whether it is the atrial or the nodal areas in this picture, you can see this is the tachycardia circuit within the AV node. This is the re-entry of the impulse, that is the re-entry circuit of the impulse. The impulse is coming from the atrium towards the ventricle and again from the ventricle to the atrium. This, so it needs the two pathways from atrium to the ventricle and again from the ventricle to the atrium. And depending on these pathways, that is which pathway the tachycardia should utilize, the pathways are the one is the slow pathway and another is the fast pathway. So, which pathway tachycardia utilizes that determines where should be the P wave location? Either the tachycardia, the anti grade pathway may be slow and the retrograde pathway may be the fast, or the anti grade pathway may be the fast or the retrograde pathway may be the slow. And depending, uh, depending on this, that is pathway utilization for the anti grade and the retrograde conduction. And that determines the location of the POA, whether the POA will be very much close to the previous QRS complex or the POA will be just before the next QRS complex. So this is the types of the tachycardia. And this is the location of the POA. In case of the slow, fast atrial tachycardia, this is the uh, location of the POA just after the QRS complex. That is, the retrograde POA takes only very short time to come into the atrium from the ventricle. So this is the I mean, location of the POA. And this is the typical example, that is the examples of the typical or common atrioventricular nodal tachycardia. And here the P waves takes the longer time to come into the QLS complex. That is, it is located as the retrograde pathway is from ventricle to the atrium is slow. So it takes longer time from ventricle to the atrium to come. So it is situated just before the next QLS complex. And it is coming from the ventricle to the atrium as because this is, these are the inverted. So, this is the long RP tachycardia. The POA is retrograde. And this proves this is one of the examples of the long tachycardia. And this can be happening in case of the atypical AVN RP. And this is the inside of the heart. We can see the location of the AV node. This is the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve. And this is the upper part, and this is the lower part. This is the ostium of the coronary sinus. And as because the AVNRT, it needs two pathways. One pathway is slow and one pathway is fast. As for example, this is the anatomical location of the slow pathway that is in this figure. This is the lower part of the AV node. 
The avenue is situated in the triangle of the coach that is bounded anteriorly by the septal lip of the tricuspid valve, behind by a ligament from the upper part from here to the IVC, and the apex is formed by these two, and the base is formed by the coronary stem. So this is the anatomical location of the avenue at the lower part of the atrium, right atrium at the septal aspect. So this is the location of the AV node. And it, at its upper part, situated the first pathway. The first pathway is situated here. And slow pathway is situated the lower part. So there is physiologically two paths. That is the upper part, that is the first pathway and the slow pathway. And these two pathways connected proximally at the apex and distally by the physiologically. So it fulfills the criteria of the re-entry. That is, it fulfills the criteria of the re-entry, which includes it needs the two pathways of two degrees of conduction. That is, one is slow conduction and one is the fast conduction. These two pathways should be connected at either side. So it fulfills the criteria of the re-entry. So this is the basic criteria of the re-entry, and this is the basic criteria of the re-entry mechanism in the case of the AV nodal re-entry tachycardia. And there are two pathways situated in the AV node. That is one is the first pathway and one is the second pathway. And this is present in nearly about 30, 35% of the population. But not all person who has got the fast and slow pathway can present it with the supraventricular tachycardia. Supraventricular tachycardia needs some of the other criteria to be presented. So this can be present in case of nearly as much as up to 35% of the population. But for the re-entry to happen, it needs two pathways, that is one is the fast pathway, one is the slow pathway in case of the avenodal re-entry tachycardia. And the circuit is formed by the upper part is by the atrium, then the node, and this is the ventricle. So this includes the circuit. The circuit includes all the three structures. That is three structures are in, uh, uh, required for the re-entry to happen in case of the avenodal re-entry tachycardia. But as because the tachycardia circuit is situated within the node. So it is called the AV nodal re-entry tachycardia. And this is the fluoroscopic view. We can see this fluoroscopic view. This is the catheter. This is situated at the upper part of the AV node. That is near the first pathway. And this is lower part that is the slow pathway. So there is physiologically at least two pathways in case of the AV nodal re-entry tachycardia. And this is the basic mechanism of the AV nodal re-entry tachycardia. And this concept is required to analyze where should be the POA location? As because in this example, this is the ECG. Here we cannot see the POFs. This is the regular narrow complex tachycardia, but we cannot see the POF. That is POF is within, where it is the POF? The POF is within the QRS complex. And this is the tachycardia, the POF is just after the QRS complex. Just after the QRS complex. There is no POF, and this is the POF location. Here, this is the POF location that gives rise to the incomplete RBE pattern in the D1. This is one of the examples that is the pseudo R in case of the uh, AVNRT. So this is the POF location. And this is the, again, the POF location in the inferior lead. This is the retrograde P. This retrograde P is inverted in case of the two, three AVF. So this is the POF location. This is the POF location. That is the inverted POF just after the QRS complex within the two small square. That is the interval from the R to P is less than 80 milliseconds. Here again, R to P is less than 80 milliseconds. So POF is situated just within the 80 milliseconds from the previous QRS complex. The POF is inverted. That means the POF is, that is the retrograde. And this explains that is the AVNRT. So AVNRT may be either there should not be any visible POFs. There is a POF maybe within the QRS complex or POF may be just after the QRS complex. But what determines? That is whether the POA will be the within the QRS complex or just after the QRS. What factors determines? It is the exit of the QRS complex. That is the exit. That is the exit of the POA. Exit of the POA from the uh, from the uh, that is the circuit. That is the, the circuit is uh, that is the re-entry circuit is within the AV node. It has got exit below to the ventricle and above to the atrium. And it is the relation of the exit from the ventricle to the atrium that determines what should be the retrograde POA. If the exit is simultaneous, that is the exit into the ventricle and the atrium is at the same time, there should be no QRS. But if the exit is little 
after the uh, that is QRS complex that will determine the location of the P wave. As for example, we have the exit of the retrograde P from the AV0 to the ATM is just within the 80 millisecond, not at the same time, but within the 80 millisecond of the QRS complex. So this is the location, and this determines the location of the P wave in the ECG, where it should be. And this is the classic, there is no should not be to different. We can academically conclude some differential diagnosis, all the differential diagnosis, that is can be AVRT, this can be uh, atrial tachycardia, it can be junctional tachycardia, but classically, when there should not be visible P wave, it is almost certain we are dealing with the AVNRT, and when the P wave will should be just after the QRS complex within 80 milliseconds, again, we should think that we are dealing with the AVNRT. So these are two examples of the AVNRT is where it can be. This is called the pseudo R, and this is called the pseudo S. These are the two characteristics of the AVNRT. And this is one of the proof we can see in the EP lab that both the atrium and ventricle are contracting simultaneously. This is the, this is the, this part of the ECG during the sinus rhythm. They are participating, you can see, this is the P wave and this is the QRS complex. This is the P wave and QRS complex. That is P, that is the QRS complex after the P wave. But here we can see both the P and QRS complex are at the same time. That is simultaneous activation of both the atrium and ventricle. That is P wave is within the QRS complex. You see, this is the QRS complex and this is the location of the P wave. That is P wave is within the duration of the QRS complex. Here in this case, we cannot see the P wave with the 12 lead ECG. So this is the proof that the P wave, that is, a, that is a, both the atrium and ventricle are activating simultaneously by the re-entry circuit within the AV node. And this is one of the definite proof that the, this can be a case of the AV nodal re-entry tachycardia. There are some, some differential diagnosis, but this is the classic example of the AV nodal re-entry tachycardia. In this case, we will not see the location of the P wave. So in summary, in case of AVNRT, the P wave location can be like this. That is, there may not be visible P waves, or if P wave is present, it is always inverted in case of the two T and AVF, as because the P wave is retrograde from AV node into the atrium, or it can produce, that is this retrograde P wave can give rise to the development of the pseudo S in lead two T and AVF, or it can give rise to the development of the pseudo R in lead V1, or in case of the fast slow AVNRT tachycardia, if the retrograde pathway is slow, it will take longer time, and at that time, the, the, the P wave may be just before the next QRS complex, that giving rise to the long RP tachycardia, what happened in case of the atypical AVNRT. So this is the P wave summary of analysis in case of the AVNRT. These are the examples where should be the P wave location. This is another example of the narrow complex regular tachycardia. You see, this is the narrow complex regular tachycardia, and this is the R and this is the P in case of the lead V1, you can see. This is the R and this is the P. And the R to P is one to nearly about more than three small squares. That is more than 120 milliseconds. And again, there is some unusual morphology of the T waves in case of the lead two. So there should be the presence of the P wave that can give rise to the such type of the uh, T wave morphology in case of the lead two. So, but what were made be in the lead two? We can see clearly that is the location of the P wave in case of the lead V1. So this is the short RP tachycardia, RP, short RP tachycardia. But although it is short RP, but still the RP interval is more than 120 millisecond. This cannot be in case of the AVNRT, as because in AVNRT, the P wave should be within the QRS complex or within the 80 millisecond from the previous QRS complex. So this is the example of the AVRT, atrioventricular reentry tachycardia. They are participants. AVRT, atrioventricular reentry tachycardia. Simply we can call the AVRT. So this is the AVRT where the location of the POF from the previous QRS complex after the 80 milliseconds, usually it should be the AVRT. So this is the example of the AVRT. And in case of the AVRT, this is the reentry circuit. That is, the one is the integrated pathway, usually the normal conduction system, that is his Parkinson system, 
this is the AV node, this is the bundle of his, this is the late bundle, this is the right bundle, this is the normal conduction system, and this is the retrograde pathway. Usually the accessory pathway is the retrograde pathway. Inverse may be true. That is the integrate may be this way, retrograde may be this way, that will give rise to the orthotropic tachycardia, that is antitropic tachycardia, that, that will be described in another class just after uh, two weeks. So I will not discuss that issue later today, but for the analysis of supraventricular tachycardia, this is the atrioventricular re-entry tachycardia. This is the re-entry circuit. And the circuit starts from the atrium, going to the ventricle, and you get back to the atrium through the accessory pathway. So it, this is the atrioventricular re-entry tachycardia. So the tachycardia circuit leads atrium to ventricle, usually by the slow pathway, that is the normal hispanical contraction system, and ventricle to atrium, usually faster pathway that is more faster than the normal his Parkinson system. This is faster in relation to the normal conduction system. So this is the faster pathway. So it has got again fulfills the re-entry criteria. That is, it has got the two pathways. One is slower, that is the normal his Parkinson system. Another is the faster, that is the retrograde conduction system that is connected above at the atrium and connected below at the ventricle. So it fulfills the criteria of the re-entry circuit. So this is the uh, re-entry take area and example of the atrioventricular node uh, re-entry take area. And the ECG of these kinds of the take area, that is the sinus, that is the resting ECG, either maybe this type or maybe this type. If the conduction, this is the accessory pathway, if the accessory pathway conducts integrally during the sinus take area, that is the sinus rhythm, along with the his parking system, it will produce the delta wave. This is the delta wave. So this is the example of the, uh, this, these are the delta waves, that is the classic delta wave. This is produced when this impulse is conducted both through the accessory pathway and through the normal conduction system from atrium to the ventricle. So this is the example of the delta wave and we can see it in the uh, sinus system. But when this accessory pathway conducts only retrogradely from ventricle to the atrium, not from atrium to the ventricle integrally, then there will be such type of ECG. We will not see the delta wave. So this kinds of the is, uh, is called the concealed pathway. So the pathway that is the sinus rhythm, but whatever may be the pathway, either it is manifest or it is the concealed, this will give rise to the deployment of these types of the tachycardia. These are the narrow complex tachycardia that can happen in case of the atrioventricular re-entry tachycardia. This is the this is the location of the P wave. This is the R and this is the P. This is the R and the P this is the P. The P wave is retrograde as it is inverted. Here you can see also suspect this may be the location of the P wave. Here, here, or here. So these are the short RP tachycardia. That is RP is shorter than the PR. This is the short RP tachycardia. But the interval from the R to P is more than 80 milliseconds. So this is the narrow complex, regular, short RP tachycardia but the R to P is more than 80 milliseconds. So this can be, this should not be in case of the AVNRT. This can be example of the AVRT. And sometimes in case of the AVRT, particularly this type of the AVRT, that is the parasomal junction of re tachycardia, the P wave may be just before the QRS complex, giving rise to the long RP tachycardia, that is R and the P, and this is the P to the R. So RP is longer than the PR, so long RP tachycardia. So, the whatever may be the AVRT, there is a sinus rhythm, either delta wave present or not. The ECG presentation of AVRT would be like this short RP tachycardia, but after the 80 millisecond, or the long RP tachycardia just before the next QRS complex. But this QF should be inverted. This should not be the positive, as because the atrium is activated from ventricle to the atrium by the retrograde way. So this should be the inverted P wave. And this is the uh, this is the determinants of location of the P wave as because this is the location of the QRS complex and the exit of the P wave depending upon the location of the accessory complex that will be described in the another session. That is, it can be exit to the atria maybe here or maybe here or maybe here. So the location of the P, P wave in relation to the QRS complex is not fixed. It can be just at the close to the QRS complex just after the QRS complex, 
or significantly after the QR is complete, that is the next before the next QR is complete. So these are the factors. That's the location of the location of the uh, uh, that is the atrial insertion site of the accessory pathway and the speed of the conduction from the ventricle to the atrium from the accessory pathway that determines what should be the P wave location in the ECG. So these are the determinants of the P wave location. The, what is message is that the P wave location is not fixed. The P wave should be inverted and P wave should be seen particularly uh, just after the QRS complex on the segment of the ST segment or before the next QRS complex and giving rise to the either short RP or the long RP take idea in case of the AVRP. And this is another example. Here we can see this is the look at this should be the location of the P wave. But this is the again, if this is the location of the P wave, this is the location of the P wave, we can see this is an example of the AVRP. But again, from the 12 day DCG, the location of the P wave in case of the V4, V5, and V6 is inverted, that is the retrograde. And as the impulse is going away from this location, that is the inverted in case of the V4, V5, and V6, this can be a case of the accessory pathway situated at the lateral side. That may be a, that is the accessory pathway, left lateral type of accessory pathway. That's, that will be discussed in the another session. But who is that? Even in case of the AVRT, by analyzing the uh, narrow complex regular take idea and assuming the location of the POA, the inverted POA, we can suspect what should be the location of the uh, POA, that is accessory pathway in case of the uh, of that patient. So this is another example. These are the differential diagnosis we should always consider. This is the groups of the differential diagnosis in case of analyzing the narrow complex regular take idea. But whatever the uh, differential diagnosis, this is an example of the AVRT, that is atrioventricular tachycardia example. This is another example, that is the, this is the long RP tachycardia, RP, RP. So this is the example of the long RP tachycardia. This is the narrow complex regular tachycardia. But other than the P wave, something else we have to see for analyzing. What is the striking feature in this ECG? Dear participant, I think you can see the amplitude of the QRS complex are not fixed. One QRS complex amplitude is larger and is small, large and small. This is called the QRS alternance, electrical alternance. So presence of the electrical alternance in case of the narrow complex regular tachycardia is a diagnostic for the accessory pathway. This can be happen also in case of the AVRT as because in case of the atypical AVRT, this is not 100% proof. But this gives some clue that is more likely to be the AVRT because of the presence of the excess that is the QRS alternance more than the atypical AVRT. This is a long RP take area. It may be in case of the fast slow, that is anti-grade pathway is fast, retrograde pathway is slow in case of the AVRT. But it is more likely AVRT as because the electrical alternance is particularly a function of the heart rate. The greater the heart rate, there is the more chance of developing the QRS alternance. And it is the function of the re-entry. Any kinds of the re-entry take area can give rise to such type of QRS controllers. But it is commoner in case of AVRT than the AVNRT. So this should be a case of the AVRT. But this type of the QRS alternance, also we can see in case of the sinus rhythm. If it is present in case of the sinus rhythm, that gives some other clues of diagnosis particularly the cardiac temporate and the cardiomyopathy. So QRS alternance, particularly the amplitude of the QRS alternance during the narrow complex regular take idea, more likely AVRT than the AVNRT, but during the sinus rhythm, this should be a case of the cardiac temporate or the cardiomyopathy. That is the heart failure particularly. This is the another, another issues that we have to consider for analyzing the supraventricular take idea other than P wave. What is the hallmark in this ECG? This is the narrow complex regular take idea. That is the narrow complex regular take idea. This is the supraventricular take idea. The hallmark is the ST depression, gross ST depression, all the leads, and even the ST elevation in case of the AVR. And easily we can see 
this can be a case of the left vein disease particularly our professor abdul wahab choudhury will be happy to diagnose it uh, uh, that is a uh, left vein disease as because there is st elevation draws global st depression or the st elevation in, in case of the abrt but other than the pof other than the qrs alternates this is another important clue for analyzing the regular narrow complex tachycardia and this st depression although this patient may have the concomitant uh, coronary artery disease but it does not need to happen it is it is the characteristics of the avrt that is atrioventricular reentry tachycardia if this type of the st depression is present the more chance of having the avrt that is atrioventricular reentry tachycardia than the avnrt so qrs alternates and st depression are two other additional points other than the pof that we have to analyze for diagnosis the supraventricular paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia so in summary these are the, the some points that is the presence of the pseudo r or pseudo s st depression st elevation in avr red triggered pof on the st segment at the st segment or beginning of the tof or qrs alternates these are the some of the points that we have to consider for differentiating between the avnrt or avrt that i have already discussed so other than the pof location pof morphology and the pof axis these are the points that we have to consider for the differential diagnosis of the avnrt or avrt as because these two are the more common tachycardia but in addition to the uh, in addition to these kinds of the modalities sometimes application of the adenosine can help to diagnose these kinds of the narrow complex tachycardia this is the regular narrow complex tachycardia but the application of the adenosine clears that is the rate of the pfdl is 300 so this is the adenosine that helps to differentiate these kinds of the regular narrow complex tachycardia this is the example of the atrial flutter and this atrial tachycardia that is this regular narrow complex tachycardia terminates in the sinus rhythm this is the pof this is the pof this is the pof that is sinus rhythm that is termination of the termination of the tachycardia and clearing up and masking the pof that helps to differentiate what it can be either the atrial tachycardia or the av nodal dependent tachycardia and by this way by application of the adenosine we can differentiate we can classify the narrow complex reg regular tachycardia is nodal dependent like the avrt or avrt or nodal independent that is not dependent on the av node like this example that is the atrial flutter or atrial tachycardia or atrial fibrillation and but there are some cases where this is the this is the way of differentiating the this group of the tachycardia in the either it is av node dependent or av node independent but not always adenosine can terminate this tachycardia this is one of the example this is one of the example of the long rp tachycardia i have already shown this ecg this is the example of the long rp tachycardia this type of the tachycardia sometimes where we can see particularly in case of the cilindrin or adenosine even after application of the adenosine the tachycardia terminates but again within few seconds or minutes it again starts again terminates again starts even after the dc shock the tachycardia terminates again starts that is this type of tachycardia the incessant tachycardia this is particularly happens in case of the pjrt paroxysmal junctional reentry tachycardia and this is one of the example of the tachycardia and these are the differential diagnosis point but if adenosine does not work dc shock does not work it is more likely this is the pjrt paroxysmal junctional reentry tachycardia as because this is we are not always thinking this type of the tachycardia as because this is unusual for the avrt or the retrograde path is very slow as because it is very slow so the location of the pof is just before the next qrs alternate if the retrograde path is, should be faster the pof should be here but if the retrograde path is slower so pof location is here so this is the unusual form of the avrt and this is the commonest cause of the incessant tachycardia in children and the adolescent and reentry is the mechanism and less responsive to the adenosine and this is the one of the common example that gives rise to the development of the tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy but we are not considering differential diagnosis in the adult as because this is not a common tachycardia so it is uh, less that is we think it when these kinds of the characteristics we can see that is it does not respond to the tachycardia but this is not unusual this may happen 
So this is one of the example of the long RP take idea. And these are the characteristics of the PZRT that is considered in case of the long RP take idea. And in case of the junctional take idea, not always, this is the re-entry take idea. This is the uh, example of the, what we mean by the AV junction. This is the common thing we should consider, atrioventricular junction. What do we mean by this? That is atrioventricular junction means the AV node, that is atrioventricular junction has got the three parts. The atrial part here, this is the middle part of the compact AV node, and the distal part. So all these trucks are, all these trucks are considered the AV node, that the atrioventricular junction. And this take idea from here, sometimes they give rise to this kinds of the, that is paroxysmal junctional take idea. And not always, most of the time, the rhythm from here, the junctional escape rhythm, that is 40 to 60 beats per minute. This is the inherent junctional, that is a rate, that is the junctional escape rhythm like this. This is the junctional rhythm, and this is the normal rhythm of the junction is because this is the rate, it is about 40, and this is the location of the QF just after the QRS complex. So this is the junctional escape rhythm. This is not the take idea of the pericardia. But when the rate goes above the 60, this is called the accelerated junctional take idea. This is take idea for, he, for this kinds of the rhythm. As because its inherent rate is 60. So more than 60 is accelerated. But when the rate goes beyond more than the 100, then it's called the junctional take idea. So the junctional rhythm can be from either parts of these three parts of the AV node. And these are the examples of the rhythm, what can be arises from this kinds of the take idea, but not always. This is the re-entry take idea. Sometimes it is the junctional rhythm, sometimes it is the accelerated junctional rhythm, or sometimes it is the accelerated junctional rhythm, or sometimes it can be the junctional take idea. And this junctional take idea, either it may be automatic or it can be paroxysmal. And this paroxysmal, the automatic, usually does not fulfill the criteria of the re-entry. And as it does not fulfill the criteria of the re-entry, this is the reason why it does not respond to the adenosine. So long RP take idea, non responsive to adenosine, gives rise to the suspicion of the PZRT. And PZRT is the take idea that is arises from the atrioventricular junctional, uh, junctional area. And this is another example of the supraventricular take idea. That is the regular white complex take idea. So this is the example of the white complex take idea. Supraventricular take idea may be presented with this type of the ECG. And in case of the supraventricular take idea, most of the time it is due to the average of the QRS morphology. And average of the QRS morphology either may be functional because of the partial refractory phase of the either of the pathways, usually the right pathway as it is the narrower than the left pathway. This is not the anatomical block or two anatomical block may be present. That is the two anatomical block may be either in the right bundle branch or left bundle branch. So supraventricular take idea again may be presented with this kinds of the ECG. That is regular white complex take idea. I will not discuss this issue as because white complex take idea will be discussed by Dr. Rufi Ahmed in uh, this Saturday, that is uh, on the two, that is 19th of this month. So this is the very important topics that is differential diagnosis of the white complex take idea. This is a topic for our Rufi Ahmed sir that, that will be happen just after the Saturday afternoon. So I'll not discuss this issue. So these are the examples of the different kinds of the supraventricular take idea. So ECG is not the only means to diagnose the supraventricular take idea. There are other means. There is the pharmacological means, as I have discussed, like the adenosine, or there will be some vagal maneuvers that also help to differential diagnose that, super, that is the supraventricular take idea. Or, some, uh, or sometimes we use the pacing maneuvers. Unlike we use the pacing maneuvers in the EP lab, we cannot differential, we cannot uh, definitely diagnose the supraventricular take idea. So ECG is not the final means. We should not consider this is the only way for uh, clean cut, confirmed diagnosis of the supraventricular take idea. Many of the times we need these types of the help. So this is not the ECG that will give all types of the answer, but ECG is very much important for the uh, differential diagnosis and initial, that is index of suspicion for the differential diagnosis of the, but most of the times it is possible to 
diagnose the supra what types of the supra ventricle but sometimes this not always this is the this is the examples in few cases so in summary supra ventricular tachycardia is a very common arrhythmia its prevalence is nearly 35 per 100000 people so this is not uncommon tachycardia and very interesting this is a disease of the healthy people actually most of the healthy people are presented in this case of the tachycardia and another important information this most of the time this is a curable disease so we should diagnose it this is the reason we should diagnose clearly the, this types of the tachycardia so we should not avoid the diagnosis of this tachycardia but this is not all about this tachycardia there are many things to know and more in the next time thank you very much for your kind participation thank you thank you atar bhai i think with each lecture i come to understand the how little lecture i do <laughs> each time sometimes i get little bit depressed there so many factors so many information uh, can i remember all that but the most important thing is perhaps treatment wise for a group certain type of uh, tachycardia you uh, take up a certain type of treatment you achieve the success and then analyze which type of tachycardia it was uh fir us dekho to sir there are good number of questions uh, some of them are being already answered by dr afik ahmed sir should i repeat this question sir why not this uh, progression better sakib okay. okay sir sir one oh, question sir. from dr rehan in atrial fibrillation no p wave but how p rate calculated athar sir i think um, uh, i think uh, rupika bhai sir is here sir no athar please answer that yes yeah. yeah, sir actually uh, the fibrillated wave uh, uh, the, it is difficult but sometimes we can see not always the fibrillated wave may be the mane uh, very fine fibrillated waves or the coarse fibrillated waves this is not always possible to calculate the rate of the fibrillated wave but sometimes it is possible if the fibrillators are organized that is it is depends about the morphology of the fibrillated waves whether it is very fine if it is very fine and difficult to see then it is not possible but if it is organized then we can calculate the fibrillated that is the rate of the tachycardia and as these are not regular so we should calculate the number of the waves in 10 seconds or like this then we can multiply this interval into the uh, convert it into the 60 seconds this is the way we can consider that is a that is a by calculate the number of the fibrillated waves but this is not always possible if we cannot see the fibrillated waves clearly can i add something yes nice. actually when we say the p wave here we do not mean the sinus p wave any atrial depolarization wave we call it p wave but is it sinus p wave is it junctional p wave is it flutter wave actually we mean that it's a atrial depolarization wave that's what actually athar bhai was saying and you can only Uh, assume the rate if this is coarse atrial fibrillation otherwise fine atrial fibrillation is very difficult and only the ep persons like you can actually determine that from the a uh, study yes, uh, it can be determined from intracardiac tracing cardiac electrocardiography easily it is um, countable but uh, from surface it is very difficult to count the rate true 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 yes lovik said do you want to comment on that no i think uh, jamila athar answered the question and there is no point of even trying i mean intracardiac we can but the rate is so fast the rate varies between 500 to 700 bits per minute um so um once it is actual fibrillation there is no point of saying that um, p wave rate is such and such yeah i thank you thank you sir uh, next question if in atrial flutter with 3 is to 1 or 4 is to 1 conduction qrs complex rate is less than 100 is it tachycardia in a patient oh. with atrial fibrillation flutter with 3 is to 1 or 4 is to 1 the atrial rate is more than 100 but the ventricular rate is less than 100 should we call it tachycardia so so it is by definition this is the atrial tachycardia this is the atrial tachycardia is because this is atrial flutter is an example of the atrial tachycardia where the flutter rate is more than 100 usually 300 plus plus 50 but 
but the ventricular response may not fulfill the criteria of the tachycardia is because ventricular response may be depending upon the block in the AV node. As for example, if it is two is one, it may be one fifty. It is three is one, like this. So it should not be mentioned that it is tachycardia. It is atrial flutter. You, you should just mention it is atrial flutter with this type of the ratio. That is either fixed block like this two is one, three is one, or four is one, or the variable block like this. And again, you can uh, some uh, at the adjective like this the ventricular response is fast or ventricular response is slow. So uh, I think this term is not applicable for the ventricular rate. This term is applicable for the atrial rate. That is the flutter rate that fulfills the criteria of the take area. That is the more than hundred and it is three hundred plus minus fifty. Actually, when we say take area or take uh, area, we actually mean uh, according to the ventricular rate. That's important for our clinical context. But for the etiology from the ECG, we do not mean that atrial uh, uh, take area. We call that. Atrial tachycardia means the rate is high, and that's from atrial rate is high, particularly from the atria. Flutter rate is also high from uh, atria. Fibrillation rate is high from atria, but ventricular rate we mentioned it uh, separately. And he is very right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, as we say in case of atrial fibrillation, the AF, AF with fast ventricular rate, AF with uh, normal rate, AF with slow ventricular rate. That's what's like. Thank you, sir. Dr. Rafiq, sir, uh, do you want to add anything, sir? Yeah, no, I'm fine with that. But there's a, a question about electrical alternates. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I I'm coming to add that. Yes. Sir, uh, there's a question by Dr. Kurmi. Uh, features of Mahim fiber tachycardia. Atar, sir, do you want to answer this question? Yeah, actually, uh, this is the issue that will be discussed in the late lecture. That is about the accessory pathways. Okay, sir. Okay. Sir. Uh, yeah. Um, that. Uh, another question by Dr. Rehan: Long RP means more than 80 millisecond or more? No, 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 no. What does exactly long RP means? No, no. Long RP means that is the that is the that is the it is the interval from the uh, previous QRS to P exactly. and the P to the next QRS. QRS. It is the yes. ratio between these two. The P wave may be at the middle part of the both QRS complex. That is the RP maybe that is at the mid part of the QRS complex. That is the uh, RP may be equal to the PR, so it is a uh, that is a uh, that is a it is a ratio that is a R to P and the P to R. So this is the way how to differentiate with the long RP and the short RP. If the R to P is longer, then it is called the long RP. But most of the time, except in case of the sinus tachycardia and atrial tachycardia, the P before the next QRS is inverted and that implies most of the if it is inverted we are happy that is it is not the sinus tachycardia this is the retrograde p wave either maybe avrt atypical avrt or the atrial tachycardia if the p wave is inverted particularly in case of the lead 2 so but when it is p wave is uh, positive particularly in case of the lead 2 and just before the tachycardia by definition this is example of the long rp tachycardia and sinus tachycardia is the best example sometimes atrial tachycardia may happen so it is the r to p and p to r Thank you, sir. Uh, in AVRT, P always negative or it may be positive also. AVRT, P. In AVRT, is P always negative or it may be positive also? At the most of the time, as because AVRT, uh, this, yes, is, this is also uh, will be discussed in the next session, but in case of the AVRT, the tachycardia may be antidromic or orthodromic. Orthodromics means the anti-grade pathway from the atrium to the ventricle through the normal conduction system. And the retrograde pathway from ventricle to the atrium, that is from below upwards, that is retrograde way from ventricle to the atrium, that is the retrograde pathway. So in this case, their P must be, must be the inverted, that is the negative. So in case of the orthodromic AVRT, it must be uh, negative. But in case of the antidromic, if it can be seen, yes, there maybe it can be positive, but most of the time the uh, presentation of the AVRT is orthodromic, narrow QRS, and the T is inverted classically. Thank you, sir. Uh, Doctor Rehan, just asked... make a comment. Uh, just a sir. brief comment. So, yes, sir. What Arthur said, I'm just going to make it a little simple. If the reentrant circuit and the activation of the atrium is coming from below. That means either from AV node reentry or atrioventricular reentry, 
the electrical signal will move from inferior part of the atrium to the top part. So the leads that are going to be negative will be leads two, three AVF yeah. in yeah. all cases. In other situations, it will be variable, like Athar showed in ECG, possible left lateral accessory pathway. In that case, it will be negative in V6. But the, all these re-entrant tachycardia plus an inferior atrial tachycardia will have negative P wave in leads two, three AVF. Please do not confuse it with negative in all leads. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rehan uh, asked a question. We, he, he confuses P wave, that is inverted P wave with T wave frequently. How we can differentiate these two things? The P wave after R wave, which is often inverted, and it is confusing with T wave. How to differentiate this P wave and T wave? Can yes. I answer that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll be happy, sir. Yeah, I, I'm get, I get confused too. So the answer is yes. <laughs> so I, I, it, the, the whole point is that you come up with a presumptive diagnosis. Like if the P wave is really overlapping on the T wave, you can't see it. I mean, you can be the best scholar, best electrophysiologist in the world, but you will not see it. You cannot make something like So yes, it, it, this is confusing for all of us. What we try to do is other showed an ECG where in V4, V5, V6, there is some distortion of the ST segment. And he made an assumption that was the P wave. And the way we find the P wave is we see, we look at multiple tracings. See, yes, I can see it all the time. It's not an artifact. That's what it is. And then you, I get confused too. I'm sure all of us get confused. Yes, sir. Thank you, Thank you sir. Uh, Dr. Hiruel Amin asked, when we tell paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. What is the definition of paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia? As a paroxysmal means that is the onset of the tachycardia is sudden, all on a sudden, the sudden onset. And the tachycardia, how much, that is uh, how long it will uh, persist, that is not the question. When it terminates, it is again suddenly. That is sudden starts, sudden cause. This is the characteristic of the paroxysmal. So paroxysmal tachycardia, Usually, this is also a criteria for the reentry. When the perusable criteria fulfills, the mechanism is usually the reentry tachycardia, not always. There is some automatic tachycardia, as for example, the perusable junctional reentry tachycardia. Without reentry mechanism, this may happen. But most of the time, classically, this is the reentry mechanism and sudden start, sudden off. This is the characteristic of the perusable tachycardia. Thank you, sir. Uh, is it possible that AVRT becomes white complex tachycardia? Yes, AVRT. Both AVRT and AVNT, but most, uh, most of the time it is the AVRT, then the yes, AVNRT sir. that can produce the rate related bundle branch block aberration. Yes, bundle branch block aberration is not uncommon in case of the supraventricular tachycardia, and it constitutes 15% of all the wide complex tachycardia that will be discussed in the lake, next lecture by our sir. So yes, supraventricular tachycardia may be presented with the wide complex tachycardia and it is most commoner in AVRT than the AV, that is AVRT than the AVNRT. No, thank you, sir. There is a question like slow or fast pathway, is it genetically determined? present in all patient or only in pathological condition? So I think uh, I will uh, happy uh, Rupika will sir answer to this question, but initially I will to talk as because I have shown in the lake sir as because uh, if we if we analyze these kinds of the physiology in the EP lab, it can be observed in nearly about 35% of the population, but all the population having these kinds of the dual physiology this is the physiological concept, then the anatomical concept, but there is some anatomical consideration as because what I have shown in the uh, location of the uh, AV node and the upper part shows the location of the fast pathway and the lower part is the uh, slow pathway, but the concept is more physiological than the anatomical. And this concept, that is this kind of the physiology may be observed in, in up to 35% of the population, but not all population heavy these kinds of the physiology will develop the supraventricular tachycardia. Sir, if we, uh, 
can i add something other way uh, yeah sure it, it is more uh, congenital than genetic oh yes congenital than the acquired it's congenital not genetic congenitally yes, there is a slow and fast pathway and it is physiological no doubt there is no definite um, histological difference of the cells around the av node uh, but it's not genetic professor uh, yes i i i I, precisely the point that Dr. Jamil made. We have to be careful when we use the term genetic. Genetic mm -hmm. will be long QT syndrome. That means if a patient has that, they can pass it on to their children. Mm -hmm. Avenural dual physiology is the electrical phenomena, I, whether it's anatomic or not, that's a different story, but it is not genetic. People are born with it. Um, and that's what uh, we are trying to emphasize. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, a question from Dr. Shohidul Bogra. Uh, how to manage the case of recurrent SBT in CCU when adenosine fails? Uh, Atar, sir. Yes, uh, when adenosine fails, that uh, again, uh, we have to review the diagnosis of this case, particularly as I have shown, as because there are some kinds of the tachycardia. Adenosine fails means in case of the narrow complex tachycardia, it may not be the AV nodal dependent supraventricular tachycardia. There are other alternative diagnoses you have to consider as because although it looks like the supraventricular tachycardia, it may be atrial flutter, it may be atrial tachycardia, or it may be the parenchymal junctional re entry tachycardia. And this kind of the tachycardia usually does not respond uh, quite well to this uh, adenosine. The, they respond, but again, they can start the tachycardia. So we have to review the diagnosis again. But if the patient is clinically unstable, hemodynamically unstable, we have to think about the non-pharmacological manifold, particularly the cardio version for the immediate safety of the patient. So if adenosine does not respond, we have to think even the administration of the adenosine, whether it is in the proper way or not, this is also a point we have to consider. So these are the things we have to rethink when adenosine fails to terminate the tachycardia. Okay, sir. And it should be uh, pushed yes, very, very rapid. Otherwise, it is not going to work. It's uh, yeah. half life is very short. Okay, so so it is... suddenly it should yeah, be pushed this... to the intervenous and flushed with saline. Okay, this is this is the point. I think Dr. Jamil is is making a very very important point. Is the common reason of failure of adenosine is how we inject it. The the half-life of the medicine is nine seconds. Yes. So let's say I have connected an IV syringe to an IV line. I inject the adenosine. I take that syringe off, then put another syringe and flush it. I have actually crossed nine seconds. Yes, what okay. I do, what I do is, first of all, put a three-way stop cord. Yes. So in one syringe, there is 20 cc or 50 cc of flush. The other syringe is the adenosine. So you inject the adenosine and turn the quickly and then flush it fast. The other trick that we do is we lift the arm of the patient to make the drainage first. So if six milligram doesn't work, we give uh, 12 milligram. A maximum, we rarely give 18 milligram. Now, once we give that, two things will happen. One, if it is a reentrant circuit, a true ventricular reentry or a node reentry, they will be blocking the AV node. And it will stop the tachycardia, most likely. If it is atrial tachycardia or atrial flutter with one-to-one -one conduction, it will block the AV node and we'll be able to see the flutter wave. And in that case, there is no point of trying it again. If the SVT stopped and started again, I may try one more time to see if it works. If then it does not work. Let's say I have given adenosine, patient came back to SVT again after two minutes. I give second dose of adenosine, it comes back to SVT after two minutes. Am I going to give electric shock to that patient? Yes, I can. But if I do the electric shock, it will come back again. So then I will have to think of something that works. So I can put the patient on intravenous delta IgM drip. I can be careful about the blood pressure. Extremely rarely, extremely rarely, if the patient is very sick, let's say somebody with septic shock, recurrent SVT, with a systolic pressure of 90 millimeter of mercury. And 
I gave adenosine, it stopped, it came back, or I gave um, electric shock, it came back. The only drug that you can start in intravenous amiodarone because amiodarone will not change the blood pressure too much unless we give it bolus. So rarely, extremely rarely, we, we will use the intravenous. So the sequence wise, first adenosine, if after adenosine there is recurrence of the SVT quickly, um, there is no point of trying to shock. I think we will have to then give intravenous delta them um, and then consider amiodarone. Uh, and the other thing is that if, of course, Arthur mentioned that if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, then of course, uh, there is only one treatment of choice, which is electrical shock treatment. Please remember that you will not want to be shocked when you are awake. So please try to call anesthesia department and sedate the patient and then give electric shock. That's very, very important. Thank you, sir. Um, next question, uh, why electrical alternance occurs in AVRT? Yeah, I wanted to touch that point. Very, yes, I, I, what I do, I cannot remember things if I don't understand it. So electrical alternance is a vague phenomena and the typical time that we find is in pericardial effusion. Why? Because the heart is floating in this fluid and it is changing direction, flip-flopping, and it's called rocking of the heart. And you get one QRS small, one QRS longer. Why will that happen in SVT? Nobody knows the mechanism. And also, why is it seen more in atrioventricular reentry than avinod reentry? So what they have said that maybe it is possible, I just imagine Atar's picture that there is an accessory pathway on the left side of the heart. So electrical signal went back through the left side, came through the atrium and going down to the AV node. And that patient by any chance had a dual electrical system and that goes through the slow pathway. Next time the signal comes, goes through the fast pathway. And the way it, this theory came about is if you carefully look at those electrical alternates, you will find that there is some variation in the RR interval. So that is the mechanism that has been postulated that maybe this patient has dual physiology. It will, one signal goes to the fast pathway, conduct to the QRS, another slow pathway, they will not. And that's why we see it more commonly in atrioventricular reentry and atrial tachycardia rather than AV node reentry. So these are all theories. Uh, it will be very, very tough, but the, this alternation in RR interval, you can actually map it. If you look at the ECG that Arthur showed, and if you measure it, you may find that there is some variation in RR interval of that ECG. Uh, Thank you, sir. I think there are, what is the highest level of ventricular rate in sinus tachycardia, sir? In case of the flows, in case of the yes, sinus tachycardia, that is, we can see what is happening in case of the uh, treadmill test. There is the maximum yes, sinus rate we calculate. That is a uh, that is a 220 minus the age. So theoretically, usually it does not happen, but theoretically it is possible that is the sinus may, rate maybe goes up to that level. That is the age minus uh, that is a 220 minus the age. This can be, but usually it is the uh, uh, but uh, without without uh, during the stress test normally. Physiologically, it is not the rate. So I think upper rate, I, I don't know what is the answer and Rubisar may add something, but the maximum rate can be, what we see in case of the stress test, there's 220 minus the age. That is the maximum predicted rate for an individual person. Is the chronotopy uh, response is okay, sir? No, I think you are absolutely right. I mean, uh, during treadmill, we take patients to 100%, 110% people who are athletic. You can go to 110% of, um, age prediction maximal heart rate. So there is no limit to that. Um, so by rate itself, we cannot differentiate it. Thank you, sir. Uh, one of the question by Lieutenant Colin Nijam. What is the treatment of paroxysmal junctional reentry tachycardia as it is refractory adenosine and DC shock? I think, uh, Atasa, do you want to make any comment on this? Yes, I say the money, most of the time it is difficult even pharmacologically and even uh, that is by the ablation. This is a very difficult type of the arrangement to treat. But still, 
it is the ablation that is the treatment of soils that is a uh, that is a ablation is a treatment of soils for the uh, uh, that is a curative treatment of soils for this uh, for example junctional reentry tegade but this is always a very difficult tegade to treat but this is the treatment of soils usually drug works very little to this type of the tegade uh, regarding sinus tegade there is a, a good question or comment by dr ajay datto why 220 is the magic number of maximum sinus tachycardia in uh, ett or in other cases we use the term number 220 why it is 220 mm. trophic surface I... no no idea i don't know why they came that number what from what is what would make her what is there is a master of this question <laughs> and i could not find it <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask that question, but you said we assume that uh, most of the time sinus tachycardia do not exceed most of the time do not exceed 160 is well scenario except in treadmill. So uh, whenever it crosses 140, you have to be cautious whether it is actually it will flutter with this to one conduction uh, or uh, it is sinus tachycardia that we have to be uh, taking care of. uh one thing is that for example in a junction at parkinson tachycardia if you it, it, it's very difficult what drug are you going to use after by so I, i i want to comment about yes, this sir, yes sir pjrt pjrt is uncommon in adults yeah it is more common in pediatric patient post surgery yes so it is more common in post post cardiac surgery in pediatric in adults when we call pgrt we have to be careful that whether we are missing avenodre entry or not so it is possible that it's avenodre entry and we cannot see that treatment wise if you look at the junction avenode is calcium current dependent and if you want to choose a benign medication it will be a calcium channel blocker if you look at the avenode um, the there is some effect of the beta blocker so we can try beta blocker we can try calcium channel blocker and then as athar mentioned that if all those fails uh, let's say somebody is 85 year old or close to 90 year old um, in this country or in bangladesh 75 80 year old and we believe that is really paroxysmal junctional tachycardia and i have a choice nothing works i have a choice between amiodarone and going for an ep and ablation because what would happen with pjrt that if once we try to ablate this patient i am actually ablating the junction there is high likelihood that this patient will end up in heart block so the choice would be am i going to take that risk or take the risk of a side effect of a drug like amiodarone and this are a thinking process that we have to consider first we have to confirm that this is a junctional tachycardia without any reentry in circuit it's not even no reentry tachycardia that is we are missing so those are all the options that will but I, in general in my practice i mean we rarely see this paroxysmal pure paroxysmal junctional tachycardia in adults so one of the comment by dr rohan is uh, should we use cv line for adenosine injection so do you so the, que- the question is oh so so l- let's look at the scenario A 32-year-old man comes to the emergency room. He is having palpitation. Blood pressure is 110 over 60, and I am that patient. And you want to put a central line in me? Question to will as a physician, I have to ask myself that if you say that I am the best person who can put central line, and I'm going to put a central line in you, do you think I'm going to agree to that? absolutely not no Thank on the you. other hand if somebody is needing a central line for something else and there is already an existing central line i will use that central line to inject it but then i will reduce the dose by half so you have to be careful so no i will not put a central line just for that mm-hmm. i think for any procedure that we do i ask myself every time i go to the room i look at my patient look at how, how many lines hanging from the patient's body and i ask am i going to use any of these lines today if the answer is no 
I'll take it out. Because the more line we put in any patient, the more infection risk that is. And this is actually one of the commonest cause of hospital acquired infection, all these lines that we put in patient. Actually, the misplaced central line is one of the cause of atrial arrhythmias. Because if it goes down below, it will irritate the right atrium and cause some arrhythmia as well. Mm. Thank you. Thank uh, you. We have got Professor Moshin Hoshin with us. Uh, uh, to Dr. Moshin Hoshin, please answer. What are the prophylactic drugs for recurrent SBT and when we should refer a patient of SBT to for ablation? Prophylaxis is mainly narrow complex tachycardia. If the patient does not have a documented atrial fibrillation, a choice of long term prophylaxis is usually valpamil, uh, diltiazim, beta blocker. These are the commonly drug we can use with for long term prophylaxis. If the patient has a recurrent symptom, then the patient needs uh, ablation. If the patient has minimum symptom once a year, but twice a year, then we can patient and patient and hypertension, we can keep this patient on uh, drugs. So we shouldn't refer uh, on the first time to for ablation on the first counter. No, first first counter time usually, if the first time the access pathway if the, uh, and patient are high risk group, that is the patient is, uh, that is uh, diaper, patient is uh, what is called uh, high risk profession. Work, uh, high risk profession then we can update this patient. Otherwise, we can keep it here. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, I, I, I want to add one thing. Yeah. First time attack and the patient lost consciousness is an indication for ablation. Another thing is uh, uh, if um, it is uh, in case of AVRT, if it is antidromic, then first attack is an indication for ablation. Rafik said, do you want to add anything, sir? Well, it, it, this is a very, very important question. Let's say I, I am in the office and this patient comes and tells me he's 35 year old, first episode of supraventricular tachycardia. He went to the emergency room, he got adenosine and he was sent home on Delta Azam 120 milligrams daily. What am I going to do? Um, this patient has, uh, did not pass out, minimally symptomatic. First thing I'm going to do, I'm going to stop the medicine. Yes. Because he, he waited 35 years for his first episode. It may be another 35 years before he gets his second episode. Yes. Now, this patient goes home, comes back after three months with another episode of SVT. And at that point, I have to make a decision that now I need to treat this patient. And that will be that is the point that we are going to make decision whether we send the patient for ablation or medication. Now, Interestingly, that patient also had hypertension. So he needs the medicine anyway. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put a calcium child blocker and send him home. He comes back again after three months with another episode of SBT. Now it is time to consider ablation or increase the dose of the medicine. Um, here in America, 20 years ago, we insisted that they fail at least one or two medicines. Now we do not, we give patients choice, but remember, even in the best hand in the world, there will be hard block with avinodri and tachycardia ablation, one in 200. And that we must remember that. So a clinical scenario, so not only ablation, the question is whether the patient needs medical treatment at all or not. Now, let's say that patient that I sent home without any medicine comes back after five years, another opposite of SVT. What am I going to do? I'm going to send him home again because go and wait for five years, it will come back again. Because if I treat him with medicine, I will have to wait for five years before I know the treatment work, whether it is ablation or medication. So these are the important points that we have to consider. Um, one of the things that we do when you send these patients home, we make sure that the patient can reach me. So I tell them, call my office if you have a problem and then we'll take care of you. But please remember one thing that the, if I'm a patient, I'll be very anxious. And if a physician says, you can call my office um, and I'll get back to you. And if I really do that, it's a big, big comfort for the patient. And I think that is important that we are giving support, psychological support to the patient that he said, look, I'm not lost. 
I have patients who travel out of the country and I tell them, if you get SVT in Germany, call me. I have friends in Germany. If they go to Bangladesh, I tell them the same thing. You go to Bangladesh, you have a problem, call me, and then I will find you a doctor there because it will be easier for me to find a doctor. So whole point is the compassion and proper caring. Thank you. Are you going to do the question, question answers? Uh, uh, there are a lot of questions, but I think we should move to the next session, right. the okay. interactive ECG session by Dr. Rafik Amit, sir. Uh, sir, you can start. The, by the time you share, you are sharing your skin, a quick comment on a question, well, how to differentiate sinoatrial uh, re-entry tachycardia and sinus tachycardia? Atta, sir. I think, uh, Firoz, okay, we, we can go for, we can go for think, the uh, next during, session. Okay. Uh, during the ECG, we can discuss the issue, but already Sara shared the screen. Uh, I think we should okay, concentrate. Sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay. okay. Sir. So the, uh, we, my point, focus is to look at ECGs that are relevant to the lectures, but please don't, please remember, uh, patients don't come to us with announcements. So I'm going to, I may change topics. I, my ECGs today will also touch into the situation where we uh, have computer generated ECGs. Sometimes they are correct, sometimes they are not. And it will, so uh, first question and the answer for answer and, uh, and discussion will be Professor Odut for this lecture. So this is the patient. And I think we have um, the um, computer system today. Choice of one, uh, two, three, four. Yes, sir. A, B, C, D, sir. Oh, one, two, three, four. Right. It's one, fine. Two, three, you can call A, B, C, D. Yes. One will be A. Tarek. Kamrul, bhai. Sir. Pol da chalu karen, pol. So instead of one, two, three, four, please use A, B, C, D. And Firoz will keep time. Please. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Sure, sir. Uh, I think we have crossed 30 seconds time. And... Sir, we started. I'll start, sir. Oh, now we start now? Okay. Sir, I'm yeah. going to stop with okay. it. Uh, okay, uh, dear attendants, please go for the uh, uh, comments again by A, B, C, D. Those who have already made comment, make uh, the choice again. Over, sir. Can we the you can stop now. You can stop now and give us the result. Full most result. Of the, most of the result 47% is C, 19% uh, <laughs> A, 9% B, and 26% D. Well, my plan, was, okay, my plan was that I will say, what well, you are 100% successful and it will be 100% somewhere. <laughs> so I leave this. Uh, for discussion to uh, Professor Wadud, because uh, he talked about ST segment. Look at the CCG. This is a 30 year old male. Three days of constant non exertional chest pain. Is it MI? If it is MI, three days old, there should be prominent key wave. It's not there. So the number two is out. Number one is normal ECG. Well, if it is normal ECG, the patient has a problem. Why the patient has a problem? We should look for something else. So logically, norm, normal uh, ECG should not be considered. Number three is pericarditis. And four is early repolarization. Young men presenting with a slight ST elevation could be, but look at the ST elevation distribution. It's present in multiple leaves, many where. And whatever the if it's pericarditis as a choice, look at the PR segment in lead two, it's slightly depressed from the TP segment. Look at the PR segment in NDR, it's slightly elevated. What is paid ST changes? Elevation not typical of MI, not limited to a simple arterial territory, 
associated with PR segment depression in inferior legs and elevation in FER is going to be in this scenario pericarditis. Okay. Thank you. I think, sir? Yeah, this is a classic ECG for pericarditis because you have all the features PR segment depression, diffuse ST elevation, um, and um, synostic PR elevation in AVR and some sinus take a little bit of sir, high risk. Sir, is there ST depression in lead three? Yeah, but remember that only lead three, single lead, do not represent a, uh, any definitive diagnosis. You have to have the similar change at least in two contiguous leads. That criteria is not fulfilled. Not three AVF, not two, two, two three. So only three. Okay. So we have. Sir, sir, what are the points against early repolarization pattern? The scenario. At number one, the diffuse distribution, number two, the PR segment change that's present in here. That's the point. These two are the plausible causes. Thank you. This pericarditis has more winning point. So we are going for pericarditis. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Next one. Um, yes, sir. Okay, so this is a 79 year old female. Um, I have written the heart rate there. Um, it's uh, 120 something, yes. can stop now it's 30 second show us the result sir 50 percent says it is c and 17 percent a 17 percent b 17 percent d yeah this is unique unique result so no, I, a I b d all 17 percent yeah it is it is fair I, I think that's that's pretty fair uh, answer so question would be um i'll leave it to Atahar to discuss this ECG. I did not put a clinical scenario. The heart rate was 121, right? Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Sir, Atta, sir, uh, please. sir, it is the regular narrow QRS take idea. Yes. We can see the POA before East QRS complex. But yes. the PR interval is nearly about 200 millisecond. The PR is particularly biphasic in lead 2. And it is negative in V1. And the P1 is also negative in case of the lateral leads, particularly V4, V5, and V6. Yes. So my differential diagnosis, what we have written is that the atrial take idea, sinus take idea. First of all, I want to exclude the sinus take idea as because the PO morphology in lead 2 does not look like the sinus morphology, particularly in case of the lead 2. This is not the sinus morphology. So from lead 2, looking at the P morphology, I can exclude the sinus take idea. Then SV2 with AV nodal re-entering take idea. The P wave location does not support this diagnosis, sir. As because yes. the P wave is just in between. That is the, uh, yes. uh, that is the, it is the just short RP take idea than the long RP take idea. This is definitely we should consider but it is uh, by the location of the P wave, it is not uh, avionatal re-entry take area. Again, yes, it can be one of the differential diagnosis for the atrioventricular re-entry take area. Yes. The first of all, finally, sir, AVRT and the atrial take area are the most two important things we have to consider. But because of the location of the P wave, biphasic P wave in lead two, the negative P wave in V5, V6, I will consider the atrial take area first over the Atrioventricular reentry take idea, sir. Okay. I, I, I think, I think what, all the diagnosis. All the, yeah, go ahead. Rate, rate is 120 only. Yes. So the rate is 120. Sometimes we see some slow SVT, atrial tachycardia, but I think all these are possible diagnoses. I mean, yes. best would be if I see this patient in telemetry floor and 
if the heart rate is constant at 121, then I will say this is not sinus tachycardia. That will be the clue. Technical scenario of the patient. But other than that, any of those diagnoses I will take. If you look at the P wave, I'm thinking that maybe in lead V1, I'm pointing the arrow. This is the terminal negative component of the P wave in V1. So maybe it looks like that. In lead three or two, if you look at lead three, the T wave is inverted, or I, I can't tell which is whether it's negative or positive. It, it which is distorting what. But if I assume this is positive P wave, so I think the possibilities are all of those possibilities: sinus tachycardia with first degree AV block, atrial tachycardia with a first degree AV block, and AV nodal reentrant tachycardia, active ventricular reentrant tachycardia. All those are equal possibilities. And I think there is a reason for showing this. And if you look at this, is the um, August 8th. And next same day, a um, little later, look at this. So this patient has baseline first degree AV block. Yes. And if you look at lead V1, it's a biphasic. And that superimposed on the and the lead 2, the funny looking. Piece. So basically, that was sinus tachycardia with first degree AV block. And the point we are trying to make here to all the audience that is in, none of us was correct. And so that's what medicine is all about. I will look at the clinical scenario of the patient, but I think telemetry monitoring would be the main clue to this patient, not the single point ECG. And I will never put this ECG in an exam to determine whether the, my student is competent or incompetent to read ECGs. This will be an ECG that will be for discussion because if I give this ECG to 10 cardiologists, they will answer all those answers that you have given me today. Thank you. So next one. This is a, a 61 year old male, and this, this is the ECG and the computer generated ECG reporting is there also. Kamrul bhai, poll town Korean. Polte is it take a take a date act to Mushkil? I think what we should do, we should give about 20 seconds to look at the ECG and then give the poll. That's better. So the answer is B for 80% and A 20%. C and D zero. C and D zero. Amazing. This is good. I think uh, uh, <laughs> this is fantastic. I mean, if we look at this, the computer reported a sinus with the most short PR interval. First of all, it measured the PR interval totally wrong. There is a P wave in lead two. And if I measure the PR interval, it's about 160 milliseconds. But the P wave here is negative. And my first reflex was, this is an ectopic atrial rhythm. But if we look carefully, look at lead three, there is a P wave and there is another one. So this is basically is the atrial flutter. It's a slow atypical atrial flutter with two to one conduction. And if I took another diagnosis, I'd have taken probably ectopic atrial rhythm if I missed that, that is it. Thank you, I think this is fantastic. Um, so the same patient, um, I'll, I'll go, go to the ECG next. You see, when it goes to sinus rhythm, the PUA morphology totally changes. And I think that's why it's important always to look, find the old ECG um, to to compare the rhythm. Next one. So one question. <laughs> yes. Regarding the previous ECG, the yes. point of such a rhythm disturbance, should we look at the long QT that gives confusion? What could uh, 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 audience was asking? In the long QT here? In you the know? previous ECG, this is yes. Yes. Yeah. So the, if you look at the QT interval, it's about 460 milliseconds. Computer yes. actually measured it pretty good. 
and then you correct it, it comes up wrong. The yeah. problem with the correction is that when the heart rate is, it is so much variable, it's a, it's a little bit prolonged QT, and that, of course, will make it confusing because the other prob problem is, is this QT long because there is a superimposed? Uh, I don't think so. The Q P wave is a little earlier than that. So yeah, there is there is a minimum. I'm I'm going to report that as prolonged QT. A clinical significance, I don't know, and also it depends on which formula is being used. Um, yes. uh, the, the, the multiple formulas come up with different kind of numbers. Okay, this one. Next is this. Let's give them 20 seconds and then let's yes, put sir. up the poll. Yes, sir. Uh, the poll is a common poll. The heart rate is around 100. Now, I'll give you the heart rate. Heart rate, about, heart, rate about, heart rate is about 114 uh, beats per minute. Taking, we can stop now. Show us the result. Yeah. Oh, so seventy-five percent. It is D. D. Yes. Uh, two percent A, fourteen percent B, and nine percent C. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, I'll just talk in favor of who answered B. When I first saw this ECG, it crossed my mind because if you look at the P and look at the T, it looks like there are maybe, may, is it flatter? It's, but then, of course, the reason I put the inferior infarct diagnosis was there is a QA pattern, QS pattern. However, if you look in lead V4, V5, V6, you can clearly see the delta wave. You can remove the pole box. Yes, and then if you, um, when the rate slows down, it becomes much better. Yes. See, less pre excitation, um, but you can clearly see now this is basically that of sinus tachycardia with WPW syndrome. Thank you. It's a nice one, sir. Yes, thank you. So, this one, yeah, this is Athar's, um, basically, Athar showed multiple ECGs like that. And now put the poll box. This should be hundred percent correct. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I think um, and, uh, a fresh <laughs> memory. Do it, sir. We can now stop. Stop it. Show us the result. So 54% uh, says it is C, 40% D, hmm. and 4% uh, B. Atar, comment I on think, this, please. Sir, I think it is 100% as because the, the participants can see the P wave location. This is the regular narrow complex tiger. The heart rate is 150. Is just uh, 148 like this. Heart rate is just less than 140. Regular narrow complex tachycardia. So if we see the analysis, the morphology that is the location of the P wave. This is in the V1. This is the location of the P wave. That is just at the beginning, just after the QRS complex at the beginning of the ST segment. And, and and I think that it is within just at the 80 millisecond from the previous QRS complex. Short RP. P is at the just 80 millisecond, giving rise to the and that is RSR pattern should war in case of the V and also the location of the P wave in case of the lead two, lead three, and the inferior lead. That is the just after the QRS complex. Sir, I am in favor of the A V A N R T. Number so, three. C. Number, yeah, I think if you look in lead V1, it's a very pointy P 
P retrograde P wave. It looks a little more than 18, but if you look at lead two or yes. three, yeah. this P wave is within 80 millisecond of the QRS complex, number one, and it is negative in two, three AVF. So the primary diagnosis, I will always tell uh, AV node reentry. And I tell my patients or others that 90% of the time that will be correct. There can be some atypical um, accessory pathway. So the, 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 this, if we find this ECG, uh, negative P wave in two, three AVF within 80 millisecond, I think AV node reentry is the primary diagnosis. Secondary diagnosis will be um, active ventricular deenteric tachycardia. It cannot be sinus tachycardia. Um, it is unlikely to be flutter because I can clearly see a P wave. I cannot see another P wave. Uh, thank you. So, sir, sir, can, I, sir, can I comment, sir? Yes. Some of them are asking about the young patient, which those is who have of of the pathway very fast. Then the uh, the P wave in the V1 is looks uh, in infinity like here the pseudo R, but within the eight, some uh, accessory pathway, uh, you know, concealed accessory pathway, looks like I, I found in the EP lab. I thought it is FNRT, but in, in EP lab it is accessory pathway because the, the exit pathway is very fast. So, AV node at 20 can take it, yeah, maybe in this case. Absolutely yes, right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I do agree with uh, Dr. Mohsen. I had such type of uh, problem. I thought it's AVNRT, but later I found this left post perceptual pathway. Uh, concealed pathway. Okay, let me summarize what Dr. Moshin and uh, uh, Dr. Jamil said. Is you see, every node is in the center of the heart. Yes. And the PR in RP is very short. But if there is an accessory pathway just near the AV node, it will look exactly the same. That's why when I look at this ECG, I always tell people I'm correct 90% of the time. I will never say 100% of the time. 90% of the time I'm correct, 10% I'll be off. And that determination we make in the EP lab. And that is the reason that when we study these patients, sometimes when we think every node reentry, even in the lab, there can be confusion and we can fail to ablate them because actually we did not understand the mechanism, even in the lab. And in what I'm thinking is every node reentry, but actually this is an accessory pathway, a concealed pathway which is either on the left side, just near the septum, which can give rise to the similar picture. But for all academic purposes, 90% of the time, this is going to be Avino Drenti. The next ECG is same. Um, I'm going to skip it. Uh, we have other ECGs. So there is a P wave retrograde here. And uh, the mechanism, uh, we're not going to have any questions. So the whole point is this. This is re-entrance circuit in the Avino going down the slow pathway, coming back to the fast pathway, and the QRS comp will be first QRS, and then there is a A wave. That's why you see the timing here will be within 80 milliseconds of the QRS complex. Mm. How about mm. this one? Heart rate is around 200 beats per minute in this patient with narrow QRS. You can show the pull box. Yes, the time is over. You can show the result. Sir, 41% it is D. Uh, for 34% it is C. 17% A, 8% B. Yeah. Um, Atahar or Moshin, comment or Jamil? So, uh... Close the poll box. It's narrow, narrow complex tachycardia. And uh, there are some uh, definite P waves in the V5, V6, uh, as well as in lead standard one. Uh, this can be discerned. And so it's a long RP tachycardia. So 
So I go in favor of HL tachycardia, maybe an atypical AVRT. In favor of the active ventricular reentry, AVRT, because you can see the P wave after the uh, 80 after 80 milliseconds. So most likely the active ventricular reentry cardia with RBV right, aberration. Yeah. So why not actual flutter? Some people say actual flutter. Why not actual flutter? That's a possibility. Yeah. It's it is the actual flutter is one is to one, so it is, uh, and then it can happen. One is but... to one conduction. <laughs> yes. So but, sir, this is the part. If it is actual flutter, it will be one to one flutter. That means it's a little slow flutter. Okay. If it's two to one, that's too fast a flutter. That's one. Now the which is the P wave in V six? There is a positive. Is it the P wave, or in lead one? There is a notching of this thing. Is it the P wave? If I take the notch as the P wave, then it's a long RP tachycardia. That makes the diagnosis of atrial ventricular reentry more likely. And look at the bottom rhythm, how it ended. ended. If we look at this T wave, there is a distortion here. And after that, there is no distortion. And that helps me identify where the P wave is. Most probably, this negative component was the P wave in here. And so this, by this ECG, clearly, I mean, first diagnosis will be atrial ventricular reentry. Second, atrial tachycardia. Um, atrial flutter is very, very unlikely diagnosis in this case. Um, so this is the patient. Patient had actually WPW syndrome, and that was induced in the EP lab and atrial ventricular reentry uh, tachycardia. But please remember, in all this, all these are possible diagnoses. That's why I put those things in there. And again, the, how it happens that you go down through the AV node, produce a narrow QRS, and then come back up through the accessory pathway. How about this one? You can see heart rate is 140. Ramul bhai, please launch the poll. Poll. Yeah. You can stop now. So 40% uh, shows it's D, 30% C, and 20%, 21% B, 9% A. Okay. This is Athar CCG. B. Athar. Sir, V1 and T2 are Yes. So V1, V2 is clue to this ECG. I mean, heart rate is 140. These are all of those are possibilities. In... Atar, please comment on that. Sir, uh, Actually, yes. you showed it. You showed a similar ECG. Stop the poll box. Yeah. Yes, sir. This is a case of the long RP tachycardia, and all these things that we should consider that is a PU, there is a regular narrow complex tachycardia, heart rate is 140, that is one, nearly 150, and the POA is positive just uh, in front of the QRS complex in the uh, V1, also the clear uh, POA we can see in V2, and all the leads we can see there, but except for this one. So this is one of the example of the long RP tachycardia, that is yeah. RP is longer than the PR. So again, the differential diagnosis, maybe the FNRT, atypical AVRT particularly, or sometimes it may be the AVRT, or atrial flutter is definitely one of the possibilities when we look at the lead two and lead three. But considering all these things, sir, I am in favor of the uh, AVRT, atypical AVRT. Okay, sure. So the point was, here is if you look at lead V2, you can see a P wave very clearly, normal PR interval. That makes the diagnosis 
of atrial tachycardia or some other reaction. But what was bothering me was lead V1. Yes. You are complex looks funny there. I mean, there is there are two terminal R wave. That is possible, but unlikely. So I kept thinking, is this a second P wave? And I can see the similar thing in lead V2. There is a notch after the QRS. And then if you put a caliper there, you will find that the timing is exactly the same. And this is the first, I think, and then second, I will take a caliper. And then I will measure the interval to see if they measure. And they did measure. And then, remember the date, 26 April at 11.36 AM, same day, another ECG, sorry. Same day, an hour later, the rate has slowed down and you can see the flutter, very clear. So this was actual flutter with two to one conduction. But of course, the other diagnoses are also possibilities. And that is the whole point that look at carefully in the ECGs. Look at the V1 now, you don't see the second notch. I'm going to go back. You see the V1, there is a notch here. V2, there is a notch. And when I go to this one, V2 looks still looks funny, but in V1, that notch is gone. Almost, because it's V2, that is, it is funny because you know there is some overlap somewhere, but not on a regular basis. So this is typical actual flutter, and it's a sort of appearing flutter in lead two, three AVF, so this was typical flutter. So this, this is actually a study that I did when I was in England. Uh, um, no, later on, it, it, it's, in Los Angeles, so this is the, we induced this tachycardia during electrophysiology study. And I have given the choices. What are the diagnoses? Kamran Bhai, poll launch current. Of the poll. Stop it, Kamal Bhai. Yeah. So 62% uh, says it's D, that is SBT with RBB. Okay. And 19% it is ventricular tachycardia, and 11% atrial flutter with RBB, and 8% atrial fibrillation with RBB. Okay. I will take all those diagnoses except C. Why not C? Because this is very regular. Regular, yes. Please remember one thing. If something is very regular, one thing it is not, it is not actual fibrillation. So that is totally out of question. The rest of them are possibilities. And of course, I agree with majority of the audience, SVT with right bundle. And look at lead V1, small r, big r. But then again, it's a little bit monophysic, not typical right bundle. I had the luxury of having 12 DCG on this patient. So that made my, so having an old DCG helps. And this is the 12 DCG. Patient had baseline right bundle bind block and I induced tachycardia. So it became um, right bundle bind block. So we will discuss it a little bit. I, it brings it to the next ECG. Um, and I have put the computer diagnosis. So we'll discuss both of them together because that will clarify uh, the point. And uh, Dr. Other Dr. sent me an ECG um, from um, in my messenger. And this is, the, his ECG is exactly same as this ECG. And that's why I thought that we'll discuss it. Heart rate is 135. So the poll box. You can stop now. 
So uh, 39% says it is SB2 with RBB, 21% sinus tachycardia with RBB, 8% atrial fibrillation, and 32% ventricular tachycardia. Okay. Again, if we discuss this, one diagnosis that I will not take is atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation. Yes. I, that is not a diagnosis because um, it, it, it's very regular. Everything else is a possibility. Now, this ECG looks deceptively narrow. If you look at lead V1, it looks narrow. V2 may be narrow, but if you measure it carefully in other leads, like lead 2, it's actually 160 milliseconds. So the right bundle branch block pattern with QRS more than 140 helps tilt towards ventricular tachycardia. And then there are a few other criteria that we can use. Here it is. The RBB morphology in lead V1, monophasic R wave or QR pattern or RS pattern in lead V1 suggest VT. And if you look at lead V1 here, it is a QR pattern. And that suggests VT. In lead V6, you can have any of those morphologies, but RS ratio less than one, which it does not fulfill. There is another criteria for VT that in any chest lead from the beginning of the QRS complex to the deepest point of S wave, if it is more than 100 milliseconds, that's VT. In this case, it is 110 milliseconds. So given all those criteria, this is VT. QR pattern in V1, more than 160 milliseconds, and this beginning of the R to deepest point of S, more than 110 milliseconds, it is VT. Well, I'm just claiming it to be VT. Is it really VT? So let's look at this. This patient, I'm not going to give you the background. This is July 13th, and the patient was put on amiodarone. Look at July 28th, patients present with a similar tachycardia at a rate of 103. And now you can see something. Look at here. In lead V1 rhythm space, there's a P wave. There's a P wave. There's a, am I making it up? And then what I did, I pulled up intracardiac recordings. If you look in the bottom strip, this is the atrial signal, atrial channel, and this is the ventricular channel. This is the ECG. You can see P wave here. The big signals are P wave. And the small signals are far-field ventricular electrogram. That clearly proves the diagnosis. So if anybody had any doubt, I mean, this is how we, we reinforce our knowledge. We applied this AV dissociation formula. But one can say, well, Dr. Ahmed, you just made it up. And then, sure, it is possible that I'm just imagining it. But when I look at the intracardiac signal, I can clearly see this. So that brings us back that those criteria that were designed is correct. That means a QR pattern in V1 with the right bundle, and then duration here more than 110 milliseconds from beginning of the R to the deepest S point, and that makes it VT. And that is the same ECG Dr. Dutta has sent me on the messenger. That one shows the QR pattern, and also this duration is more than 100 milliseconds. That is ventricular tachycardia. I think. We're going to stop here. There are questions about management of white QRS in ICU. I think we should leave it for a different time um, session, right, Atar? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. 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 Now, okay. Atar, we should go to the next section. Next session. Yes, sir. Yeah. Everybody is so engrossed in the uh, discussions. Actually, we have spent so much time, but we do not uh, actually look at that. I share screen. It, can you see the ECG? Uh, not yet. Sir. No, no sir. screen share. Bond the code. This one. It our share code. Same problem. Screen share. Okay. 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 
আপনি নিচের প্যানেলে এই জুম এর নিচের প্যানেল দেখেন গ্রিন একটা ইয়ে আছে ব্ল্যাক আপ অ্যারো জাস্ট ক্লিক করেন অথবা সিলেক্টে ডাক দেন স্যার হ্যাঁ 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 আমি স্ক্রিন শেয়ার এখানে তো নিচের দিকে স্যার শেয়ার স্ক্রিন কোন প্যানেল লোয়ার প্যানেল চৌধুরী the real life scenario the patient came to me last week and the main person diabetic hypertensive he had an episode of chest pain a few weeks back he was not mentioning that he came with uh, the complaint that he is having some shortness of breath while walking upstairs he didn't have that before and on a questioning he uh, said that he had an episode of chest pain uh, um, five to six weeks back Now look at the ECG. That 12 is the initial ECG. They sent me uh, over the WhatsApp. I see that sinus rhythm, uh, limb leads unremarkable. In the chest lead, V1 quite all right, but a little bit taller. But V2, the transition is too early, and the T wave is too beautiful. Lead V2 should not show. such a good quality t wave and in accompaniment of a tall r we should think of something else so i asked my assistant over phone they do the posterior leads and look at that p7 p8 v9 there is key wave actually the patient had posterior yeah. mi now answers please tall r in v1 and t upright in t Tall are actually most importantly most visible in B two, B two. Yes, sir. B two is more prominent. Pronounce. About right. T upright. T is too beautiful. I always say that. Yes, sir. And whenever you have that, you have to have posterior lead to exclude or confirm the diagnosis of posterior mi. The most important thing is if you do not have the suspicion, index of suspicion in your mind, you are going to miss it. And unfortunately, if you give this 12 lead ECG to the echocardiographer, very often they also miss the posterior volume. They say some uh, maybe the LV dysfunction is there, and this is a old case. That's why they do not have an ST depression. The patient had history of chest pain quite a few weeks back. If it is earlier, the STD patient if it is there, then it would have been a acute to posterior MI. It's not that. I think the last week we had a inferior MI posterior MI, but this one is true posterior MI. Sir, yes, sir. I think uh, regarding the our participant has nicely. Uh, captured this diagnosis actually sir most of the participant has correctly diagnosed to this case of the old posterior mi in the facebook so i think professor choudhury is very much correct he wants to teach how to diagnose the posterior mi acute posterior mi the old posterior mi this is the old posterior mi in the last week we have shown that the infralateral that is the posterior extension of the inferior mi and this week this is the true posterior mi this is the Very old helpful. true posterior mi and this is the technique how to diagnose the true posterior mi and i think the professor uh, choudhury is Uh, effort is actually uh, 
I mean, successful actually participant has nicely captured this concept that is how to diagnose the post to MI. Sir, I think we is quite late. Uh, now, so the post we can are, finish. Post for the next post for the next Saturday. Tarek. Post at the Kaba? Yes, sir. Sir, did you see আমাদের তুশার আসলে ও সবেমাত্র কোভিড থেকে সেরে উঠেছে এখন তার সিমি তার বাসার তার মুরব্বির আপার সুস্থ তাদেরকে নিয়ে এখন হাসপাতালে ঘুরছে তাদের সবার জন্য দোয়া করি আর কি আমরা জি স্যার এটা বড় করে চাই না আর একটু বড় করে বোঝা যেত স্যার হ্যাঁ ঠিক আছে এই এই Next Saturday, we'll have a CG fish. The fish decoding LPA meets our own, our beloved graphic will be there along with Dr. Abhishek Deshmukh. They'll be talking about the blood APS and the tech APS. So, we are eagerly awaiting for that, and everybody are invited in there, along with your friends and acquaintances. Abbott Pascola is helping us, along with our own favorite Beximco, who are always there. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So, other way, conclude. So, we are going to conclude this session. Uh, what is sir? Uh, no, this is we, we do not have any formal way of ending things. We are actually so saying good night and assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum and good night. Good night, sir. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Beksinko. Thank you, all the panelists you, and teachers. Thank you all. And Firo, thank you, sir. Wonderful moderator. Uh, we want to have.